Good afternoon. My name is Ilya Shapiro. I'm a senior fellow in constitutional studies here at the Cato Institute. And I'd like to welcome you to this forum on Zubik v. Burwell, otherwise known as the Obamacare contraceptive cases, otherwise known as Hobby Lobby 2 Electric Boogaloo. Uh, two years ago, in Burwell versus Hobby Lobby, the Supreme Court ruled that regulations implementing Obamacare's preventive care mandate violated the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, or RIFRA, at least for closely held corporations. Employers with religious objections to certain contraceptives that the Department of Health and Human Services, HHS, uh, required them to cover had to be exempt. They, they thus joined churches and their auxiliaries, which HHS had already exempted from the contracep contraceptive mandate after public outrage at the scope of the initial regulation. But what about nonprofits that HHS considered insufficiently religious to merit exemption? Religious schools, charities, and the like were instead offered an accommodation. These employers had to give the government information about their insurers and sign forms allowing their health plan to provide contraceptives. The only justification for this differential treatment was that employees of organizations that aren't houses of worship are, quote, less likely to share their employer's faith. In other words, HHS refused to exempt people who work for the Little Sisters of the Poor a group of nuns who vow obedience to the Pope because they're less committed to a religious mission. Thus, the Supreme Court has taken up the issue of whether the contraceptive mandate and its accommodation violate RIFRA by forcing religious nonprofits to act in violation of their sincerely held beliefs. When the government has not proven that this compulsion is the least restrictive means of advancing a compelling interest. Here to discuss all the issues these cases raise, including what to look for at next week's argument, arguments on Wednesday, are Lori Windham, who represents one group of plaintiffs in the consolidated cases, Josh Blackman, who wrote Cato's brief, and Elizabeth Wydra, Cato's best frenemy. <laughs> I'll introduce them uh, right before each comes up. Lori Windham is senior counsel at the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty. Her work has included cases under the Free Exercise Clause, Establishment Clause, RIFRA, RLUPA, and state religious freedom laws. Her diverse clients have included Amish builders penalized for their traditional construction practices, a Santeria priest prohibited from conducting animal sacrifice, evangelical churches unable to use their property for worship, and public school districts sued for accommodating religious expression. Lori has testified before the U.S. House Judiciary Committee and the Commission on Civil Rights, and regularly appears in national media to speak about her cases. She's a graduate of Harvard Law School, earned her BA at Abilene Christian University, where she has served on the Board of Visitors and received the Young Alumnus of the Year Award. I guess it would be the Young Alumna of the Year Award. But anyway, Lori. Thank you, Ilya, and thank you for uh, having me here at Cato to discuss these wonderfully important cases. Uh, the Little Sisters of the Poor are actually the second client I have who has uh, paid for legal services in cookies. The Amish were the first, and I have to say they are world-class bakers. So we're always thankful for that. Um, who are they besides being world-class bakers? They are an order of nuns who's dedicated their lives to serving the elderly poor. And what that means for them is that they try to treat everyone in their care the same way that they would treat Jesus himself if he were there receiving care at one of their homes. We represent the Little Sisters of the Poor, along with East, East Texas Baptist, Houston Baptist, uh, and other religious groups who are now before the Supreme Court in these consolidated cases. So the Little Sisters of the Poor care for the poor not just because it's a good thing to do, although it certainly is, but because they are inspired and motivated by their faith. They have given their lives to following their faith and serving those in need, and now they are faced with a stark choice. Are they going to continue to follow the faith that has inspired them, uh, or are, uh, and for doing so, are they going to face millions of dollars in government fines? Before I dive into the legal test, I know you're all very eager to hear about the legal test. Uh, before I do, I wanted to back up for just a moment and talk about the big picture view, looking at the Affordable Care Act and the mandate specifically. Uh, it turns out that when you look at the act and the mandate, there are a lot of different exemptions, a lot of different rules that apply for different people. In fact, when you add it all up, 100 million Americans under the age of 65 do not have insurance plans that are required to comply with this mandate. That's one in three Americans who are under the age of 65. And so as a policy matter, it's hard to understand why going after and challenging the little sisters of the poor is the best way to remedy this problem. 
I'd say it's probably never a good idea to be on the other side of a case from the Little Sisters of the Poor, but if you must, uh, there... Sign them up as your plaintiff regardless of the type of case you're bringing. <laughs> uh, regardless of, um, uh, of the issue, you're talking about 45 million Americans who are on grandfathered plans. You're talking about Americans on Medicare, Americans on TRICARE, who don't have this level of mandated coverage. And so it's hard to understand why it's important to fight these religious groups all the way to the Supreme Court rather than try and remedy this problem by closing other loopholes in the law instead. Uh, and I'll come back to that in a moment, but I want to talk about the test. So these cases have reached the Supreme Court under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, affectionately known as RIFRA. Under RIFRA, there's a simple three-part test. Sometimes it's described as a four-part test. I'm going to talk about it in four parts today because I think it helps to illuminate one of the problems here. You have to have first a sincere religious exercise that is substantially burdened by government action. If those two things are true, then the burden of proof shifts to the government to show that it has a compelling interest in what it's doing and that it is using the least restrictive means available in order to do it. The religious exercise here is sincere. Nobody has challenged the uh, sincerity of the Little Sisters of the Poor or these other groups. Uh, and yet I think that the courts have often gotten hung up on this issue of what is the religious exercise. RIFRA, by its terms, protects any exercise of religion, uh, and that's important. This law was passed by Congress almost unanimously in response to a Supreme Court decision, Employment Division v. Smith, that had to do with Native Americans who were uh, using peyote, and because of that could not qualify for unemployment insurance. Uh, and so RIFRA contemplates that it's going to reach religious exercises that are not well understood or not mainstream. Here we're talking about a couple of religious exercises. It's the refusal to uh, participate in distributing these services, which are contrary to the Little Sisters' faith. And it's not just the refusal to use them or to provide them directly, but also the religiously motivated refusal to be part of the government scheme, to allow the government to come in and use their insurance plan to do what they cannot themselves do in good faith. This gets into notions and ideas of complicity. When is it wrong for me not just to do something, uh, but to participate in somebody else doing it? We all understand this idea. If somebody asks for a knife so they can, they ask me to hand them a knife so they can cut a cake, I'm going to do it. If they ask me to hand them a knife so they can stab someone, I'm not. Uh, which is a very different situation than you have here. And yet, it gets to this idea that what you're doing and why you're doing it, what you're being part of, really does matter morally. This is not a question that the Article III courts are really fit to resolve. This is a question of theology and morality. Now, it is one the courts are familiar with. There were several former U.S. attorneys general who submitted a brief on this subject to the Supreme Court saying that the ideas of complicity that we saw here uh, were actually quite similar to things that the Justice Department argues when it comes to criminal law. And there are 50 Catholic theologians who submitted a brief to the court explaining how this view of complicity works within Catholic theology. It is a theological determination. It's a long-standing and deeply rooted religious belief that they cannot be part of this scheme and this system. And it is sincere. And so the question for the courts is not whether they agree with or like this particular religious exercise. The question is whether there is a substantial burden on that exercise, and the answer is yes. Under the Supreme Court's decision in Hobby Lobby, the same penalties that are at issue here were deemed to be a substantial burden. When your faith compels you to do something or not to do something, and the price for doing that or not doing that is a government fine, uh, then you have a quintessential substantial burden. Here, the fines run into the tens of millions of dollars. The exact same statutory penalties that were addressed in Hobby Lobby, found to be substantially burdensome here, are also sub uh, substantially burdensome there, are also substantially burdensome here. It should be an open and shut case on substantial burden. So then the question is, what can the government do? The government has to prove that it has a compelling interest in imposing this mandate on the Little Sisters and the other religious groups. 
And I don't believe it can do that. When we're talking about compelling interest, it's important to note that the question is not whether this interest is important, whether it is something generally that the government wants to or should address. The question is whether the government has treated it as being compelling in this particular case, whether they need to impose it against this particular religious claimant that they have before them. Compelling interests that have turned out not to be compelling in a particular case include things like health and safety in the Lukumi case involving animal sacrifice, include things like the nation's drug laws in the Ocentro case uh, involving the use of a hallucinogen in religious ceremonies. While those interests are compelling in the abstract, they were not compelling in the particular case. And the interests the government is raising here are not compelling here. And you can see that because of what I spoke about at the beginning. There are 100 million Americans who don't have this coverage. There's a loophole for 45 million Americans who are on grandfathered health plans. Their employers don't have to provide these services, don't have to provide all of them, and don't have to provide them free of charge. Also, the government has exempted its own programs from this mandate. Medicare doesn't have to comply with the mandate, and in fact, doesn't cover all the required services. Now, you're thinking, Medicare, that's what grandma's on. Why does it matter? Actually, there are 9 million Americans under the age of 65 who are disabled and are on Medicare for that reason. And the government does not comply with the mandate when it comes to Medicare. Uh, TRICARE is also exempt. TRICARE is the insurance used by our military service members and their families. And the government, when it comes to military service members and families, has chosen to exempt TRICARE, not to cover all the mandated services, and to charge copays uh, for those services. The government, and especially its amici before the Supreme Court, have been saying that this issue of copays is really important. It has to do uh, with incentives that people uh, use and follow. Uh, and yet, when it comes to its own plan, it's decided that charging our service members and their families copays is just fine. So I don't see how the government can prove that it has a compelling interest when it has exempted plans covering tens of millions of Americans, and in fact, the plans that it itself runs and administers. So the question then is, have they used the least restrictive means available? If the government fails on either of these prongs, it loses. I think it fails on both. The government has a lot of opportunities and other ways to deliver this particular package of services to women. In fact, they admitted as much in their brief to the Supreme Court. Uh, we had criticized them in our own briefing for the small business exemption. If you're one of the 35 million Americans who works for a firm that empl employs fewer than 50 people, then your, your employer does not have to provide you with insurance at all. And the government said, well, that's OK. That doesn't undermine our compelling interest, because if the employer does provide insurance, then it'll have the mandated services. And by the way, these women can get these services in other ways. They can go on to a plan that belongs to a family member. They can go on to the exchanges and purchase a plan for which they may or may not qualify for a subsidy. They could purchase a plan directly from an insurer. They might qualify for other government programs like Medicaid, or I would add Title X. Uh, the government has a lot of different ways that it tries to address this problem and this issue. It does not need to rely on the little sisters of the poor to do it. And so that is the basic case that we'll be presenting to the Supreme Court next week, that the Little Sisters of the Poor have a sincere religious exercise, that it is burdened by this mandate, that the government does not have a compelling interest in trying to force them to do what it won't force hundreds of millions of other plans to do, and that the government has a lot of other methods and means at its disposal. And we believe and are very hopeful that the Supreme Court will rule that way. Thank you, Lori. Next, we'll hear from Josh Blackman, who's an associate professor of law at the South Texas College of Law and an adjunct scholar at Cato. He specializes in constitutional law, the Supreme Court, and the intersection of law and technology. Josh is the author of the critically acclaimed Unprecedented, the Constitutional Challenge to Obamacare, uh, and the forthcoming Unraveled, Obamacare, Executive Power, and Religious Liberty. He's also co-authored uh, a number of articles with me, uh, including is that seven? Is that, that, is that it? Uh, and numerous briefs as well. Anyway, the, the latest of which is on this case, on Zubik, coming out in the Weekly Standard uh, imminently. Uh, Josh was selected by Forbes magazine for its 30 Under 30 in Law and Policy, has testified before the House Judiciary Committee on Executive Action on Immigration, is the president of the Harlan Institute and founder of Fantasy SCOTUS, the premier Supreme Court fantasy league, and most importantly, blogs at joshblackman.com. 
He clerked for Judge Danny Boggs on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit and Judge Kim Gibson of the Western District of Pennsylvania. Josh is a graduate of the George Mason University School of Law. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be at Cato. Uh, I'm not sick. I have bad allergies, but I'll do my best to, uh, uh, to make through this. So in what has become a spring tradition, Obamacare makes yet another trip to the Supreme Court, its fourth appearance in five years. Fortunately for the Little Sisters of the Poor, a monastic order that cares for impoverished elderly and other religious nonprofits challenging the ACA's mandates, the results of the court's second and third encounters with the law can together answer the Little Sisters' prayer for relief. Two years ago, in Burwell versus Hobby Lobby stores, the justices ruled that employers could not be forced to provide morally objectionable contraceptives to their employees. Hobby Lobby's owners considered uh, certain devices that could prevent the implantation of fertilized eggs, such as the morning after pill and IUDs, to be against their religious views. This was a decision based on RIFRA, which uh, stands for the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. RIFRA stops the government from imposing a, quote, substantial burden on religious liberty un <coughs> unless there's no less burdensome way of achieving the compelling interest. Then last year, in King v. Burwell, the court refused to blindly defer to the IRS when interpreting the phrase, quote, established by the state. Why? Because the bureaucracy lacked the requisite interpretive authority and, quote, expertise to resolve this, quote, major question. In the process of deeming federal health care exchanges to be established by the states, Chief Justice John Roberts, who breaks my heart every year and will likely do so again this June, Chief Justice Roberts' majority opinion made clear that administrative agencies could not give themselves the power to answer major questions of profound social, economic, and political significance. So what do these cases have in common other than Obamacare? These cases demonstrate that it is Congress's duty to craft delicate religious accommodations to protect conscience. The bureaucracy simply does not have the ability, neither the authority or the know-how, to create legal rules in this area. The Little Sisters of the Poor, whose appeal has been consolidated with several other cases under the name of Zubik versus Burwell, argue that the Obama administration's accommodation still violates the religious free exercise. Hobby Lobby gave relief to for-profit companies, and a separate exemption applies to houses of worship. But nonprofits, whom the government considers insufficiently religious to merit the exemption, such as educational institutions and social service providers, still have to structure their insurance coverage in a way that ultimately fulfills the contraceptive mandate. Thus, another RIFRA battle looms, which in the absence of Justice Scalia's fifth vote, perhaps seems destined for a 4-4 deadlock. This is not just unsatisfying, but impracticable. Given the circuit splits, simply affirming the judgment below would allow the contraceptive mandate to survive in some states, but not in others. My colleague Ilias called this Schrodinger's mandate. But there's an alternate argument based on the holdings of Hobby Lobby and King v. Burwell that could command a majority opinion. It is this, the agencies lacked both the expertise and power to exempt some religious groups while forcing others deemed, quote, less religious to be complicit in what they consider to be sin. By rejecting the bureaucrats' assertion of executive authority, Zubik can thus be resolved without further politically fraught haggling over RIFRA. To better understand, well, our elegant solution that sidesteps the culture war debate of reproductive rights and what constitutes an abortive patient. Let's step back and look at the history of the contraceptive mandate. So this will surprise you. Contrary to common belief, Congress didn't actually enact a contraceptive mandate. All that Obamacare statutory text requires is that qualified employees provide, quote, with respect to women, preventive care, 
as provided for by the Health Resources and Services Administration. Congress also did not define what constitutes, quote, preventive care. A subsidiary agency within HHS recommended that preventive care be interpreted to include all federally approved contraceptives. HHS agreed. However, facing a wave of public outrage, HHS belatedly acknowledged that its interpretation would force millions of religious believers to violate the teachings of their various faiths. In response, HHS worked with Departments of Labor and Treasury to adjust the relevant regulations. First, they exempted certain religious employers from the mandate altogether. This exemption was limited to houses of worship and their auxiliaries. Second, other religious nonprofits, such as the Little Sisters, that the agencies deemed insufficient religious to qualify for the exemption would only receive the accommodation. This is like the skim milk version of the exemption. The agencies promulgated an alternative regulatory mechanism for these second class religious nonprofits to comply with the mandate. The employers, such as the Little Sisters, were required to turn over information about their insurers to the government and ex. <coughs> Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Obama. Thanks, Obama. <laughs> and execute instruments allowing insurers to distribute contraceptives through their health plan. The agencies don't claim that RIFR compels either the exemption or the alternative compliance mechanism. Instead, they assert that the relevant Obamacare provisions provide authority to decide which religious groups should be exempted and which receive the skim milk accommodation. Still, the government concedes that the accommodation imposes at least a minimal burden on religious free exercise. The alternative compliance regulation, however, is not authorized by the text of the ACA. No provision of the statute, which I've actually read, but no provision of that statute actually empowers any administrative agency to distinguish among religious nonprofits, exempting some while burdening others. Indeed, the statute doesn't authorize HHS or any other department to burden the free exercise of anyone. To paraphrase Chief Justice Roberts' opinion in King v. Burwell, quote, it is especially unlikely that Congress would have delegated this decision to the agencies which have no expertise in crafting religious accommodation of this sort without, without clear statutory guidance. Or, as Justice Kennedy wrote a decade ago, in the case of Gonzalez against Oregon, in which the Justice Department attempted to trump a state drug dispensing law. Kennedy wrote, the idea that Congress gave the executive branch such broad and unusual authority through an implicit delegation is not sustainable. The Obama administration's justification for its discrimination among religious groups reflects its unprecedented home-brewed approach to protecting religious exercise. The agencies concocted an exemption for churches, but not their associated religious organizations, based on the conclusory assertion that employees of the latter are, quote, less likely than the former to, quote, share their employer's faith. That HHS refused to exempt people who work for the Little Sisters of the Poor, a group of nuns who vow obedience to the Pope illustrates how out of their lead it was evalu evaluating religiosity. Administrative agencies with no legal basis issued a blanket judgment that all religious nonprofits would have employees less likely to share their employ employer's religious beliefs. At the same time, they removed the regulatory requirement that houses of worship primarily employ people who share their faith to avail themselves of the exemption. There was not even the option for a case-by-case -case judgment. Such, such haphazard and unauthorized guesswork by anonymous civil servants in the face of long-standing congressional policy to the contrary cannot justify such an infringement on religious freedom. The fact that the rulemaking was premised not on health, labor, or financial criteria, but on the department's own subjective evaluation about which employees more closely adhere the religious view of their employers confirms that the authority claimed by these agencies is to, again, quote from Gonzales v. Oregon, 
beyond their expertise and is incongruous with statutory purpose and design. Earnest and profound questions regarding the, quote, mystery of life, as the Supreme Court has discussed in its abortion jurisprudence, are the quintessential, quote, major questions that Congress does not intend agencies to resolve absent a clear delegation of statutory authority. The administration's attempt to force religious nonprofits to violate religious teaching regarding the start and nature of human life lays claim to an extravagant statutory power affecting fundamental liberty interests, one that Obamacare simply does not grant. When you combine the holdings of Hobby Lobby and Little Sisters, I'm sorry, Hobby Lobby and King against Burwell, you come up with a result that most of the justices, we hope, should be able to support. The administrative state overstepped its bounds such that religious nonprofits deserve at least the same exemption that for-profit employers now enjoy. In addition to avoiding the ideologically charged battle of Arifra, this alternate path will allow the court to set down an important limitation on executive power that will bind the next president, whoever he or she may be. Thank you very much. Thanks, Josh. Uh, just to summarize, so uh, Lori talked about the religious liberty issues and the, the RIFRA, especially the statute, and Josh says uh, you need not reach this court because administrative law principles, especially ones uh, most recently uh, delineated in King v. Burwell, uh, can tell you that the agencies don't have the power to do this sort of thing anyway without even having to get into uh, moderating the religious debates. Um, Elizabeth Wider now will uh, respond to uh, one or both of these uh, perspectives. Uh, she is the president of the Constitutional Accountability Center. From 2008 until earlier this year, she was CAC's chief counsel. A graduate of Claremont McKenna College and Yale Law School, Elizabeth previously practiced at Quinn Emanuel Urquhart and Sullivan in San Francisco. Her legal practice focuses on Supreme Court litigation and high stakes cases in the federal courts of appeals. She has represented congressional leaders, preeminent constitutional scholars and historians, state and local legislators, and government organizations, and groups such as Justice at Stake, League of Women Voters, and AARP. I should also add uh, that uh, Elizabeth has joined, uh, and CAC has joined with me and with Cato uh, twice uh, in recent times, uh, once on the uh, battles over the Second Amendment, uh, once over the battles on same-sex marriage. Uh, the first time was the Privileges or Immunities Clause, then Equal Protection Clause. So I like to joke that the next time that we get together, it'll clearly be in a, a drugs case involving the, uh, the Due Process Clause. Uh, Elizabeth appears frequently in print and TV, and especially on Fox News. Uh, please. Thank you so much, Ilya, and thank you all for being here today. I always enjoy coming to Cato and talking with uh, my, my friends over here. As, uh, as Ilya said, we like to think that we're best frenemies. Sometimes we're just straight up friends. You know, we, we have find common cause where we can um, on some civil liberties issues. We've agreed on uh, some Fourth Amendment issues as well as uh, the constitutional issues that Ilya mentioned. So, um, and even when we disagree, I always enjoy the fact that we can disagree without being disagreeable and any debate over the Constitution, I feel like, is putting the spotlight on the right place, which is the Constitution itself. So I'm delighted to be here. I even co-authored a book with one of our colleagues, David Gans, on Hobby Lobby, as it happened. Yes. Uh, so getting to where we are today, um, I submit that this is not a case about whether or not there should be a, an accommodation in order to avoid forcing religious nonprofit employers to provide contraception coverage to their employees. No one questions the sincerity or importance of the religious beliefs being asserted here. I certainly don't, the government doesn't, and that is why there is an accommodation in place. So we're not arguing about whether there should be an accommodation. We're arguing about whether the accommodation that is provided, enabling these religious nonprofit employers to avoid providing contraception to their employees, is itself insufficient under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. The petitioners assert a right not only to be relieved of the obligation to provide contraception coverage themselves, but also to prevent the government from arranging for third parties to fulfill the resulting gap. 
if accepted, this claim would deny tens of thousands of women the health coverage to which they are entitled under federal law and subject them to the harms that the law was designed to eliminate. It would also, I think, very importantly, and I want to make this argument chiefly here today, stretch the idea of religious accommodation to a point that cannot be sustained under our constitutional history and in our diverse and pluralistic nation. What Zubik and other challengers to the accommodation is suggest is a textbook substantial burden on religious exercise, or as Lori said here today, an open and shut case of substantial burden, is in fact a constitutionally accepted common practice. That is, accommodating religious objectors by shifting their obligations to third parties who do not share that objection. In fact, religious accommodations have often required religious objectors to play a far more active role in shifting that responsibility than does the accommodation here. For example, requiring religious objectors opposed to war to pay for a substitute to serve or take some other form of alternative service to satisfy the important interests of the government. In the most recent case on religious accommodations, which has been discussed already, the Hobby Lobby case, the court there struck a balance holding that the religious accommodation contained in the Affordable Care Act's regulations provides the key to reconciling the rights of employers, employees, and the government. As described by the court in its majority opinion, the accommodation is, the accommodation that we're talking about here today, which was not provided to the for-profit, small, uh, uh, closely held companies there, but in describing this accommodation, they said it's an alternative that, dis that achieves all of the government's aims while providing greater respect for religious liberty and ensuring that women would still be entitled to all FDA-approved contraceptives without cost sharing. As Justice Kennedy put it in his concurrence in Hobby Lobby, the accommodation equally furthers the government's interest, but does not impinge on the plaintiff's religious beliefs. Yet the petitioners and my friends here today contend that that religious accommodation hailed in Hobby Lobby violates their rights under RFRA. Even though the accommodation eliminates any role for the employer in the provision of contraception services, and shifts the burden of paying for these contraceptive coverage to insurance companies or to the government. But petitioners and my friends here today, even despite that, nonetheless insist that it is unlawful because in their view, the government may not require them to fill out a simple form or even notify the government that they qualify for the accommodation. This is wrong. And this claim is also profoundly inconsistent with how religious accommodation has long been understood in this country as evidenced by the history of conscientious objector laws enacted over the entire sweep of our nation's history, from colonial time up to the present. Here, I think using the words of the Supreme Court in New York versus Eisner, a page of history is worth a volume of logic. Accommodations of the sort contained in the Affordable Care Act's regulations, which allow religious objectors to opt out while third parties fulfill their obligations, represent a long-standing method of ensuring religious liberty while also protecting the rights of third parties and furthering important interests of the government. Indeed, for our nation's history, this has been a common feature of the conscientious objector laws applicable to military service, where religious objectors were required to do far more than fill out a form. The founding generation that wrote our constitutional guarantees that protect religious free exercise were very familiar with conscientious objector laws that allowed individuals with a religious objection to refuse to participate in combat while also requiring them to pay money to furnish a substitute. So that, that is paying money to get someone else to take your place in battle. Numerous revolutionary era state constitutions and laws contained religious accommodations that required a religious objector to pay money to furnish an equivalent in order to aid in defense of his nation or to find uh, a substitute or to provide alternative service. This balance reflected in the words of a prominent and important of Pennsylvania minister, Reverend Francis Allison. It provided that all should have a free use of their religion, but so as not on that score to burden or oppress others. And since the Civil War, federal draft laws have accommodated individuals with a religious objection to war, requiring them to perform alternative service. We no longer require that if you object, you have to find another person to go in your stead. Um, under these laws, an individual who considers war sinful cannot refuse to participate in the war effort entirely or obstruct third parties from participating in the military. And indeed, the process for applying for conscientious objector status is far more involved than filling out a form. It requires registration with a selective service, 
an interview with a chaplain, and a subsequent government investigation. If the government grants the application for conscientious objector status, another person, obviously, must serve in that objector's place. The religious objector is relieved of his legal obligation to go to war, but he is not permitted to hinder the draft or the war effort in general by claiming that calling up the next draftee makes him complicit in sin. Yet such a governmental hindrance would flow precisely from the logic of the argument that is being put forth today, that the ACA's religious accommodation substantially burdens their free exercise of religion, as it would enable them to bar insurance companies from stepping in to take over their legal obligations under the ACA. This simply takes the idea of religious accommodation too far. Our Constitution and our laws place the highest values on religious liberty, recognizing the right to practice one's religion as critical to freedom, dignity, and self-definition. And I think this is one of our greatest features of our Constitution and our society. But the Affordable Care Act has already accommodated the beliefs of those who have a religious objection to contraception. What the religious employers challenging the ACA's religious accommodation here want to prevent insurance companies from taking over their legal duty would subvert religious liberty, not protect it. It would allow employers to impose their own religious beliefs on their employees, who of course have their own personal religious beliefs, and deny them important federal rights secured to them by the Affordable Care Act. Women would be left without access to the most effective forms of contraception to which they are legally entitled. Throughout American history, religious accommodations that allow objectors to opt out and to transfer their legal duties to others have been a crucial means of respecting religious liberty in a nation of diverse faiths. Such religious accommodations, like those contained in the Affordable Care Act and which were given an endorsement in the Hobby Lobby case, ensure, as Reverend Francis Allison explained more than 250 years ago, that all should have a free use of their religion, but so as not on that score to burden or oppress others, as I mentioned earlier. And that is exactly what the accommodation at issue it here accomplishes. It simply does not amount to a substantial burden on the free exercise of religion. And so I think the claim fails on the first part of the test under RIFRA, which Lori laid out earlier. Now, with respect to the administrative claims that uh, my friends at Cato make, I think that they're interesting, and I think the, uh, you know, the agency deference points are uh, an interesting feature of their brief, but um, the court declined to add them to the question presented in this case, and as their brief notes, while an APA claim was made in the Little Sisters litigation, it wasn't addressed by the Tenth Circuit or the district court. So I don't think that those will feature very... Um, will really be determinative in, in the court uh, in this go-round. Um, but I think when the court does look at the claims before it and looks back at the reasoning in the Hobby Lobby decision, I think there is a very good chance that the court will uphold the accommodation, and I don't think it necessarily will be a 4-4 split. But of course, as usual, all eyes will be on Justice Kennedy at the argument to see how he feels about the religious liberty claims in this case. Um, I think we'll probably get a good idea um, from the argument, whether he's riled up about it or not. Um, and uh, certainly, if the arguments in the uh, abortion access case from just a few weeks ago are any guide, the uh, women justices will be on fire just like they were back then. So I'm sure it'll be a very interesting argument, and I'm sure I will see all of these folks here. All right, I'm going to ask the, uh, the panelists to respond to each other in a moment, and then we'll turn to your questions and answers. And also, um, I have been uh, checking my uh, March Madness bracket, as you've seen me on my phone. I've been looking at the Twitter feed because uh, you can, those of you watching uh, uh, at home or in your office, not here, uh, you can tweet questions at me, at iShapiro. Uh, if you like, you can use the hashtag uh, Cato Events. But regardless, uh, any questions out there in cyberspace, uh, tweet them uh, to me, at iShapiro. Uh, Lori, do you want to respond to anything that Elizabeth said? On the, uh, uh, on the point, I think Elizabeth raises some really good issues, some of which we actually don't disagree on. I think that the government can find ways to serve its interests here and to use truly third-party means to provide these goods and services. I think the government's pretty weak if the little sisters of the poor can hinder them from providing and ensuring health care for Americans. The government has a lot of different ways to do this. The problem here is the means that they have chosen. Uh, they have chosen a method that they have admitted to the Supreme Court actually does
does take over a portion of the health care plan of the religious organizations. So this is not uh, uh, this is not preventing the government from doing something. The government has lots of options. Uh, and this is not about third parties stepping in. This is actually a party that uh, the religious groups have a contractual relationship with and are continuing to work with uh, in order to provide health care. It's about the government coming in and taking over a piece of your contract and saying, okay, this thing that you have con contracted to say you will not provide, now ensure you must provide it. Um, the uh, selective service uh, and, and draft example is very interesting. I think a lot of its power comes from the government's obviously compelling interest in raising an army. It's a bit different from the government's interest in providing a package of goods and services that is generally available on the market. Uh, but even the... Uh, the analogy, I think, breaks down. When you start talking about hiring a substitute is pretty interesting. That is a system that was tried in the early, early colonial era in which we have not carried forward to today. It's actually the system that the Confederacy used during the Civil War. Uh, and Quakers went to jail over their refusal to pay for a substitute and be part of that. Uh, what we have today instead is something where a religious objector can object and can then... Uh, provide alternative service to the country in some other way, and then the government drafts someone else. They don't have to go enter into a contract with someone uh, to provide that service for them. They don't have to stay in the contract. They don't have to take a piece of paper and go hand it to somebody and say, hey, I'm objecting to the draft, now you're on the hook. They step out, and it's completely the government's decision uh, whether to draft someone else, who to draft, and how they go about doing that. What you have instead uh, is a system where the Little Sisters of the Poor are providing health insurance. They're complying with the vast majority of things that the ACA requires them to do. They want to continue providing health insurance for their employees. And in fact, they're providing most of the other items that are uh, required, or all the other items that are required under the Women's Preventive Care Mandate. They're not objecting to well woman exams. They're not objecting to uh, domestic violence counseling or, uh, or gestational diabetes screening or the other things that are required. They're simply objecting to a very narrow subset of goods and services, like someone who could say, yes, I will serve my country, I just won't hold a gun while I'm doing it. Uh, and so I think that you can, in fact, accommodate the Little Sisters here and the other religious groups without seeing a system of religious accommodations come crashing down. Hi. So um, I appreciate uh, Elizabeth and uh, uh, Laurie's comments. I think what we have to remember is that the ACA says nothing about this. If you actually go back to the history of the ACA, there was a fairly significant debate over whether it would fund the coverage of abortions. Um, House Democrat Bart Stupak, a pro-life Democrat, uh, was a pivotal vote to get the ACA enacted. And in order to secure the vote of Stupak and his pro-life acolytes, um, President Obama issued an executive order which, which insisted that there would not be any coverage for abortions. Um, the executive order was worthless, as, as most executive orders are. But Stupak has said, had he known the law would be interpreted in this manner, he would have never voted for it. Indeed, during the legislative history over this, and I read through the entire thing, out of thousands of comments about the women's health mandate, virtually every single comment concerned women's health like mammograms. They were all about mammograms. There were a couple stray references to birth control and contraceptives, but that was in the vast majority. Not, not that I think legislative history is particularly relevant, but there was a deliberate effort to keep this quiet with the clear assumption that once this gets delegated to whatever agency got, got the question, they would then ramp up the regulations and impose a contraceptive mandate. During the implementation of this mandate, there was a tone deafness on the administration that's frankly stunning. Um, initially, Initially, the Little Sisters were not given any accommodation. They were required to pay for the contraceptives themselves. And only after a massive outrage, and indeed it was massive, did the Obama administration change course and provide it. I think this reaffirms the fact that these agencies have no idea what the heck they're doing concerning religious liberty. They are out of their leagues, and the court should not defer. Now, um, Elizabeth is exactly correct. In our search stage brief, we asked the court to add the question presented. Um, they did not. Unsurprisingly, they usually don't listen to me, which is fine. Um, but if indeed this case deadlocks 4-4, it very likely may be re-argued. And this could provide an alternate ground with an additional question presented to reach the issue without having to go down the road of questioning substantial burden, 
and least tailored, uh, least restrictive means. <laughs> Thank you. Um, before we turn to the audience, I have one question that I wanted to uh, pose, uh, I guess probably to Lori uh, and Elizabeth. How much do you think uh, this will be different than the Hobby Lobby uh, argument? Uh, I joke that it's you know Hobby Lobby too, but will there be a lot of discussion on uh, whether the uh, hoops that the little sisters and everyone else has to jump through, uh, whether that's a substantial burden, which was really not an issue in Hobby Lobby, the, the, the idea that the uh, having to pay for the uh, what they consider to be abortifacients was indeed a substantial burden, and so everything turned on the uh, the third prong of RIFRA, the, the least restrictive means. But are we going to see half of the argument here being about, well, what do you actually have to do? Just sign the form? Is that burdensome, really? Or you know, what do you think about that? I think that uh, it's going to be different. In Hobby Lobby, of course, the issue that uh, took a lot of attention, both the court and the public consciousness, was this question of the corporations and their rights. We're not going to have that issue here, obviously. Everyone agrees that the Little Sisters of the Poor and these other groups are entitled to uh, rights under RIFRA. It's just a question of how those rights play out. I think there may be some uh, discussion about exactly how the so-called accommodation works. The government has really tried to paint this uh, and, and make what I think is a straw man argument, saying they object to objecting. They don't. They've notified their government of their objection many times. Uh, they object to the government coming in and forcing them to take part in its system and take over a piece of their health care plan. I imagine we'll hear a lot about that at the argument, and I imagine we will hear as well about the government's alternatives and whether it has really borne its burden to prove that there's no other way that it can do this. I'd be curious to hear what Elizabeth thinks. Yeah, I think, um, you know, uh, first on that on that particular point, I think there will be a lot of talk about how the accommodation actually works um, because the government in its brief has said that the way that the petitioners characterize the way the accommodation works is in fact a legal mischaracterization of the accommodation. So I suspect that that will have a lot of back and forth between the parties and the justices of precisely how the accommodation works. Um, you know, there seemed to be a, a clear acceptance that the idea that providing preventive health services to women um, was indeed a compelling government interest, and I would be very surprised if the Supreme Court did not agree this time that that was true. Um, so I think that while that might underlay some of the uh, non-Supreme Court objections to what is going on here, I don't think it will actually hold sway in the Supreme Court. Um, and on that point, I just wanted to respond to something that Josh said. There certainly was no hiding the fact that contraception coverage was something that the Affordable Care Act was um, intended to include. There was indeed a women's health amendment, which uh, was trumpeted as something that would allow for preventive health services to women and specifically reduce unintended pregnancies by providing for contraception coverage without cost sharing. It was something that was lauded by supporters of the bill, understandably perhaps not liked by opponents of the bill, but certainly it doesn't, uh, you know, I, I think it's, in, it, it's not right to use it to feed into this idea of somehow the Affordable Care Act being some shady thing that was, you know, a midnight deal. In fact, it was something that supporters of the law were very proud of, um, Senator Boxer in particular. Um, so I, I think, you know, we'll see a lot in the argument. I think it'll be heated. I think that, uh, you know, it's been interesting to see the way the court has changed in the way that arguments have gone on since the sad passing of Justice Scalia. So I think this will be yet another case, but we'll see um, how um, his absence is felt. All right, let's turn to audience questions. So please wait to be called on, wait for the microphone, identify yourself and any affiliation, and actually ask a question. Those are the ground rules. Front row. Hi, I'm Ron Lindsay. I'm uh, the president of the Center for Inquiry. I uh, have two questions for uh, Mr. Blackman. Uh, good brief, by the way, which I had a chance to at least skim before yep. uh, the session. If I understand, the main point of your argument is that regulatory agencies uh, don't have the authority or capacity to make this distinction between religious nonprofits. So as you say, they can't grant uh, religious, certain religious nonprofits this complete exemption and then require others to, uh, they only grant, grant them the skim milk version of this accommodation. Uh, perhaps not in this case because the government can't, I guess, redo what it's done, but in the future, couldn't the government just meet your concern by saying, look, we're not going to grant any religious nonprofit a complete exemption. All religious nonprofits will have to file a form or do something to get an accommodation. That's question number one. Question number two is related to that. On your theory, would it be the case that 
if any nonprofit claimed to be can't claim to be religious, could any government agency ever question that? In other words, if on the IRS form, when they file for tax exempt status, they check the box saying they're religious nonprofit, isn't that the end of it? Right. So, so, so thank you for the question. Um, uh, the first point in response. Um, when you're dealing with this sort of governmental decision, um, the government has never taken the position that RIFRA compels the exemption. They've never taken the position that RIFRA compels the accommodation. If the federal government took the position that they will give no one an exemption, I think they would lose very, very quickly. Um, uh, to, to your second question, though, um, one of the factors of RIFRA is whether belief is sincerely held. And this has actually come up in litigation over tax exempt status. For example, um, people make up a new church for the sole purpose of getting tax exempt status, and they question whether that's a sincerely held belief. Um, the government has been very um, astute in not challenging the sincerity of Hobby Lobby or Little Sisters. Um, I think there was one point in Hobby Lobby arguments, Laurie may remember the exact version, but where uh, I think it was Sotomayor or Kagan said, wow, you guys pick perfect clients. And then Paul Clement said something like, we didn't pick them. You came to us. Um, so there hasn't been any challenging and sincerity grounds. Um, I think it's certainly the case that the government has a duty to accommodate religious liberty. Um, for example, if you're a prisoner under RELUPA, um, you have to find ways to accommodate religion. But to use an example like that, that I've used before, it would be like saying that Orthodox Jews get kosher meals, but perhaps Reformed Jews don't because they're not quite as religious. Um, I don't think the government should be in the business of making those sorts of close calls. Thank you. Our next question comes from Twitter. Alyssa Hewley, who's a master's in public health, who's a healthcare reporter and advocate, asks, what, if any, is the role of state HIE, I don't know what that is, health insurance examiners, HIE, I don't know if any of you know. Health insurance exchange, very good, thank you. What, what if any, is the role of the state health insurance exchange to regulate religious accommodations for employers? Anyone have an opinion on that? We're all simple constitutional <laughs> scholars here, folks. We don't know the intricacies of these complicated. I represented groups. military historians. Yeah. We, you know, we didn't touch on that. <laughs> um, so sorry about that. Uh, let's see. We'll go right here. There was a question. Um, my name is Becky Steele. I'm the treasurer of the tax exempt site of a Quaker lobby organization that's a nonprofit. So this discussion is extremely important to me. And I wanted to carry it a little further into the 401k plan and retirement plan context, because one of the issues I've been looking at is our religious objection um, to certain types of investments and whether we can impose that on the investment options that are available to our employees in the retirement plans. There, um, we did receive an IRS private letter ruling that we were a church plan. Although I know there's a lot of litigation in that context now, it's really um, kind of related. So what I wanted to ask you was to take this a little bit further out, and how far does it go? How far can employers um, extend their religious beliefs in other ways that they deal with employees? Um, I'll answer this much. So in Hobby Lobby, Justice Ginsburg's opinion tried to raise the specter that the granting of an accommodation to a private for-profit business would lead to religious groups raising religion as a defense to a racial discrimination claim. And to justify that, uh, Justice Ginsburg had to cite a couple cases from the 80s and a few cases from the 60s, none of which were successful claims. Um, I, I frankly think the fears that this doctrine will be extended to allow racial discrimination is overblown. Even the two years since Hobby Lobby, I mean, may, maybe I'm wrong, but I haven't seen any big cases come up where groups have asserted it. Um, this does raise itself, though, in the LGBT context, which, which is uh, something which, um, depending how Title VII is interpreted by the EEOC, we may already have a nationwide prohibition on LGBT discrimination. We just never knew it. Um, so that issue is more likely to come up soon. John Roberts will rewrite the statute to that effect shortly. 
A question from Twitter. And again, if those of you watching at home can tweet to me at iShapiro. Uh, this is from Lori Sobel, who's a senior policy analyst at Kaiser Family Foundation, asks, this is, I guess, a factual question for Lori. Uh, how many people are employed by Little Sisters of the Poor? How many are nuns? How many are not nuns? Um, that is a great question. I do not know the exact number. Uh, the Little Sisters of the Poor, obviously, uh, the nuns themselves. Uh, are not the issue here, you know, the government has been interested in the employees who work with them and work for them. Um, what I do know is that the number employed uh, by the groups in this lawsuit is something like one one thousandth of uh, the number of people who are exempt under this law for other reasons. And so what we're talking about here is even when you add everybody together, uh, a relatively small number of people, especially compared to the very large exemptions that are already present in this mandate. Back there. Devin Watkins, Kiddo Institute. Um, it seems to me that the uh, distinction uh, that's being made is one of, on the one hand, the religious organizations seem to be willing to say that we're willing to tell the government and provide notice to the government that we're opting out, but they're not willing to go so far as to say we are going to authorize someone else to provide these contraceptions. Um, is that the distinction that's trying to be made? And for the people that oppose that, um, does that um, – seem like much more than just mere notice is to authorize and say that you, someone else potentially can act as an agent on their behalf to compel that. So I think that that is a, a good way to phrase it. One way we've described it is the dual purpose objection, where you're not just saying I object, which again, the Little Sisters have done uh, more than once, uh, but to do it on a form that says, I object on the front side and on the back side says, okay, now insurer, here are the obligations that have been placed on you because of my objection. And you can uh, pass that form directly to your insurer, you can give it to the government, and they will generate that form and send it to your insurer. And so there is, uh, there are legal ramifications uh, that go along with this objection rather than just the mere fact of objecting. Yeah, so I, um, just to provide a little more detail, the, uh, so the two ways that you can opt out are by filling out um, uh, a form known, known as, known charmingly as EBSA Form 700, um, which requires the employer to certify that it has a religious objection to providing contraception coverage and that it is eligible to opt out. And the only other information required on that form is the name and contact information of the person making the certification. And that, in that instance, would be sent to the plan's health insurer, or in the case of a self-insured plan, to its third-party administrator. The other way that has been uh, formulated by the, de the departments to add an alternative opt-out procedure um, is simply for uh, augmenting that already EBSA Form 700 accommodation to allow eligible organizations to opt out of the contraceptive mandate by providing written notification of their objections to the Secretary of HHS rather than to their insurers or their third-party administrators. EBSA Form 700 sounds like a Star Wars character. <laughs> uh, there's a question right here. Uh, I'm Kenneth Jost, author of Supreme Court Yearbook and my blog, Jost on Justice. Um, my question, I'll state the question and then have to elaborate on it. The question is, what do you think of this argument raised in an amicus brief by the group Compassion and Choices, a death with dignity group? In its brief, uh, the, uh, the group notes that 47 states have laws that require health care providers to respect a patient's uh, in effect, right to die claims. If, if, and uh, it expresses concern that a broad ruling for the petitioners in this case could undermine those laws and give Catholic hospitals uh, the right to say, I'm sorry, we're not going to transfer you to some place that would allow you to die with dignity. You've got to die here not in dignity, not in comfort, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's their, uh, that's, as I say, what they raise in an amicus brief. Is there a danger to, uh, to that interest uh, in, in a ruling, in a potential ruling for the petitioners? Thanks. <laughs> 
Uh, short answer, no. Uh, and I would note that uh, many states do recognize that there can be uh, conflicts between religious belief and health care, and they uh, regulate those in a smart way, which is to provide for uh, religious exemptions for groups who cannot comply with something, uh, you know, a particular order, and uh, for people who still want to be able to go elsewhere and receive particular care or, or lack of care in this case. And I think it's a far cry uh, to compare somebody who's in a hospital and can't leave uh, with somebody who is simply going out in the marketplace to go and choose a package of insurance services that is best for her. Uh, RIFRA mandates a case-by-case -case analysis, it mandates a look at the compelling interest, uh, and it mandates that you look at the particular situation that you're in, and so I think those are very different cases. I think there's probably a difference between um, a mandate on an employer uh, versus a mandate on a healthcare provider. It's kind of a um, you know, degrees of separation from uh, the actual provision of the, of the healthcare. Right there. Hi, my name is Laura Russell. I'm interning with the office of Senator Bill Cassidy. My question is, for the entire panel, what do you think the common ground is between the two sides in this argument, and how would you characterize it? Um, I think that's a great question. Thank you so much for asking it. Um, you know, I think there is actually a lot of common ground. There certainly are a lot of areas of, uh, you know, strong and passionate disagreement. But I think that uh, certainly the Solicitor General in his brief and his presentation that he's always made on this issue, and certainly I can say for my part, there is a deep respect for um, uh, religious liberty and uh, respect for the sincerely held beliefs of the petitioners in this case. And you know, I don't think that there is uh, any um, uh, anything other than deep respect on that side. You know, there are certainly very strong legal disagreements, um, but I think that that is certainly something that is a common ground. And, you know, I come from a place of wanting to preserve the ability to have a religiously diverse nation that respects the free exercise of people of all faiths, while also recognizing that we do live in a pluralistic society, and so there are balances to be made between religious liberty and compelling government interest and the ability to have our society function properly. But I think I, I think uh, that we're all trying to get to that proper balance. We might strike it differently, but I think we're all trying to reach the, the same point. Yeah, I think that we are trying to strike a balance and we disagree over exactly where it should be struck. I think another place where we have common ground is that the government uh, has the ability to do this and has a lot of different options in order to provide these services to women. Uh, and so we're not talking about the Little Sisters of the Poor coming into court and saying, hey, you can't do this at all. You have to get rid of this mandate for everyone. We often talk in terms of something being struck down when you're talking about a Supreme Court decision. Uh, what they're asking for is really a very narrow and targeted exemption uh, for themselves and for others who share their same faith. What the government is able to do outside of that arena uh, is pretty broad, and I think there is a lot of common ground in that area. Any more questions? David Sobelson, Washington, D.C. Um, since there are no objections from anyone to any kind of health care provided to men, is anyone making the argument that singling out something that only involves women is discrimination and that preventing discrimination is a compelling state interest? I'll, I'll take a stab at that one. Let's actually respond to Elizabeth's point before. Um, indeed, during the uh, lengthy floor debates over the Women's Health Amendment, there were a couple of comments by Senator um, Franken from Minnesota and a few others where they mention um, birth control. But there was a very prominent statement by Senator Mikulski of Maryland, and I'll just quote it. She said, alert, alert, alert. We have just been informed that a shrill advocacy group is spreading lies about the Women's Health Amendment. <laughs> They're saying that because it's about prevention, it includes abortion services. There are no abortion services, including the Mikulski Amendment. It is screening for diseases that are the biggest kills to women, the silent kills of women. It also provides 
Family planning, but family plan is recognized by other acts. Please no more lies. Let's go to offense save lives. So this relies on a very, um, uh, on a statutory definition. Um, under federal law, and the government has taken this position in various regulations, um, products like the morning after pill, plan B, Ella, are not deemed abortion services under federal, it's actually not even a statute, it's under a regulation that the Clinton administration implemented. Um, but this floor statement was made to assuage concerns by pro-life Senator Bill Casey from Pennsylvania and a few others who were assured that there would not be something which they may consider abortion irrespective of federal law. Um, I'm not aware that any arguments have been made that this actually violates some sort of intermediate scrutiny because it provides special benefits. I think the government, to the extent they're enacting a health law, can take cognizance of the fact that women have certain needs that men don't. I don't see any problem there. I think there's a, you know, there's a definitely a legitimate interest there. Um, I, I will never need some of these products that females will. Um, but the history of this bill was very deliberate to try to minimize any um, argument that this would cover things like Plan B and um, Ella or the morning after pill. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I, I think, you know, moving away from our common ground question, um, you know, that's really not an issue that is in this case. I think that there are, um, that the government has not objected to the characterization um, that uh, someone might believe that some of these forms of contraception cover and coverage are abortifacient, even though some of the medical community might disagree with that. But that is not an issue in this case, and I frankly don't want to get in a discussion of that, because that's for another day. Um, I think that's taking us to a lower level that I don't want to go to. Um, but, you know, as to your question about um, uh, women's health services, part of the impetus for providing for um, contraception coverage and the other health screenings that go along uh, with this part of the Affordable Care Act is that uh, is not to provide special treatment, but to provide equal treatment to women, recognizing that there are increased costs placed on the care given to women and making sure that these uh, women's health specific preventive screenings, which are, according to uh, mainstream medical thought, so in incredibly important, um, you know, we're talking about uh, cervical cancer screenings, uh, preventive family planning services given to women and their families that uh, they see it as equal service rather than special. Thank you. Uh, I'm Richard Fulton from the American Jewish Committee. I have a question for, for Lori. Uh, and if I understood you correctly, but if you didn't say this, I know others have. Uh, in looking at substantial burden, uh, the only thing you can look at is the, the monetary burden, as it were. One can't look at uh, whether or not, in fact, there's a substantial burden on the religious exercise as such. Uh, that is to say, once when a person says that they're complicit in an act that they're religiously prohibited from being complicit in, the government's not supposed to go behind that and see whether or not that's too attenuated a claim, whether the, uh, the, the claim of religious invo uh, involvement uh, the religious claim of involvement is so attenuated that the law simply can't recognize it, whatever the person may sincerely believe. Uh, but that can't be right. And and uh, I want to ask you about the case of Bowen against Roy, in which you had a, uh, a Native American who believed that they, they provided their social security number in order to receive services. Uh, they would be, in fact, involved in, the, uh, by, in providing a mark of the devil and providing a social security number. There may be some legit legitimacy to that claim, uh, but in any event, uh, the, uh, the court didn't require them to provide the social security number, but also uh, directed that the religious objection couldn't be a basis for telling the government that it couldn't inscribe that social security number on the records in order to facilitate that claim. So you have a case there where seemingly there's a, a religious claim of complicity uh, notwithstanding which the court in effect found the claim was simply too attenuated. So is that, is that correct? Is it the case that at some point, no matter how sincerely one believes that they are religiously complicit in an act that the courts can't recognize that, or they nevertheless have to some, find some way to accommodate that uh, to avoid that complicity, even though uh, there, there doesn't seem to be any connection that, that others would recognize? <laughs> 
I think the uh, it's an interesting question. It's one that the government has raised a lot in its own briefing. And the line that the court drew in Bowen is one that is reflected in, uh, in RIFRA as a statute as well. And that line was for religious exercise. What are you actually being asked to do? And Bowen was an interesting case because there were actually two issues there. One was, uh, can the government issue and use a social security number for this little girl, uh, little girl named, known as Little Bird of the Snow? Um, can the government give her a social security number and then rob her of spiritual power according to uh, her parents? And there the court said, well, no, this is the government's internal uh, actions. You can't come in and reach into those and, and determine them. Uh, we're not going to recognize that religious claim as a substantial burden. But then there was a second claim in Bowen that um, was different, and I think more akin to what happened here, which was could the parents be required to submit and use the social security number as a way to receive benefits for themselves? Could they actually have to be forced to take the action to use the social security number? And there, uh, the court didn't decide. Justice O'Connor and her concurrence actually said to the degree that uh, they even looked at that question, five justices spread across the other opinions uh, agreed that, in fact, the, uh, the family should be protected and shouldn't have to provide that social security number. And so I think, again, it really turns on the facts here, whereas the government uh, here has admitted that it's not just an internal government action we're talking about. It is actually uh, an action that is required of the parties. They have to do something, uh, and that it then impacts their insurance plan, their private plan, not simply something that is government action. Anyone else? Everything's been completely clear and or opaque. And so no questions, no more questions forthcoming. All right, well, we'll have to wait for Wednesday's argument. Uh, before we adjourn, I'll just remind you that there will now be lunch on the second floor. Go up the winding stairs at the George M. Yeager Conference Center. There are also uh, restrooms on this floor and, again, upstairs on this side. Um, let's thank our panel.